I like Street Fighter 2 G.I. Joe toys. And I don't. We must fight. I see we are evenly matched, but I have a secret weapon. Enjoy the Paralyzer. Ha ha ha. Say goodnight, Floppy. I cannot defeat you with my arm paralyzed, but I also have a secret weapon. Sonic Boom! I have a better idea. Instead of fighting, let's work together and review a G.I. Joe toy and a Street Fighter 2 toy. You don't want to fight to the death because we disagree? I have decided against it. This channel is a place of inclusion for all G.I. Joe fans. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. But what counts as a G.I. Joe toy? Does it include everything that had the G.I. Joe label on it? I don't count everything to be within the vintage toy line. I don't include licensed products, I don't include video games, I also don't include a set of toys that nearly every other fan considers to be part of G.I. Joe. Street Fighter 2. I swore to never review Street Fighter on this channel, and I shall not. But it would be irresponsible to talk about all of G.I. Joe and never talk about Street Fighter, so I brought in an expert, someone who knows and likes Street Fighter, the Dragon Fortress. Hi, my name is Dustin. I'm the owner and curator of the Dragon Fortress, which you can find at thedragonfortress.com. I review and wax poetic about toys from the 1990s, including our mutually beloved G.I. Joe. Thanks to the Dragon Fortress for being here, and now, HCC 788 presents the Paralyzer, and the Dragon Force presents the Sonic Boom Tank. This is the 1991 Cobra Paralyzer. This vehicle was introduced in 1991 and was available in 1991 only. It was discontinued for 1992. It did not include an action figure. There were no later versions of the Paralyzer in the vintage G.I. Joe toy line, but the entire mold was used to create the Street Fighter II Sonic Boom Tank. As a tracked vehicle, it is in the lineage of Cobra Tanks which started with the legendary Hiss Tank in 1983. Cobra tanks have always been kind of bizarre. Sometimes they barely qualify as tanks. The Hiss had a glass canopy and a streamlined body shape. In 1984, there was a Sears-exclusive red Hiss tank. There was also a more traditional tank, the Sears-exclusive CAT, which of course was recolored from the G.I. Joe Mobat tank. The 1987 Cobra Maggot was another vehicle that maybe didn't qualify as a tank. It was more of a tracked artillery vehicle. The 1988 Cobra Imp was not quite a tank it was a tracked missile vehicle. The 1989 Hiss II was based on the original Hiss design and carried over some of its design quirks. In 1991, the old Hiss tank wasn't forgotten. It was remodeled and recolored to become the Septic Tank. That was in the Eco Warriors subseries. G.I. Joe always had the advantage, though. In 1991, they had the Brawler, a much more substantial tank. In the TV commercial, the Paralyzed was pitted against the G.I. Joe Badger, an off-road vehicle. The Paralyzer was advertised during a period when G.I. Joe was producing live-action TV commercials. Some vehicles were built in full scale for those commercials, but the Paralyzer wasn't one of them. I have the box 
for the Paralyzer so we can see how this vehicle was marketed back in 1991. It is described as a fast attack vehicle with advanced track tread technology. I think I know what they mean here and we will take a look at this vehicle's tracks later in this review. Uh, we have some decent artwork here. Uh, the driver of the vehicle is the Desert Scorpion. This orange color is a bit obnoxious, but if you're going to have an orange vehicle, it makes a little more sense to have it in the desert rather than maybe a jungle environment. So we have sandy ground in the artwork. That kind of makes sense. Manning the turret, we have the Crimson Guard Immortal. We have a sticker here for the combat pay promotion. We have the same artwork on the top and the sides of the box and on the bottom. And then on the back of the box, uh, we have a photograph of the toy. It looks like this is a photograph of a prototype of the toy. There are some differences between this photograph and the toy that came out of the box. Uh, the trigger on the missile launcher is a different color. On the toy, it is orange, and here it's green. The gun on the turret does not have a plastic wire that is on the toy. Also, the hinges on the tracks are black on the box, but on the toy they are orange. Utilizing the latest in SAML weaponry, Paralyzer can stun G.I. Joe with its incredible surface-to-surface -surface firepower. And it describes what SAML is down here. That is Spring Action Missile Launch System. That's right, this vehicle has a spring-loaded missile launcher, but it also has an 80s-style flag point. It's worth two flag points. I guess they had not switched to the 90s-style flag flag points by 1991. Let's take a look at the parts and the features of the Paralyzer and let's start by looking at the main body of this vehicle. It is in a bright orange color and it has a ton of technical detail all over it. They did not skimp on the detail. Almost every millimeter of this vehicle has some kind of gadget or knob on it and it really looks great. The details are excellent. Unfortunately the choice of color can sometimes wash out those great details. Uh, it has some paper stickers. The underside of the vehicle is mostly hollow. At the front of the Paralyzer, it has an opening, I don't know what you'd call it, a hatch or a hood or a canopy, but uh, this part uh, has some detail on it. Uh, it has some stickers. It has what looks like uh, control sticks on the outside of it, but in fact, the controls are on the inside. You can open this hatch by just pulling up at the front. It is hinged at the back, and that reveals the driver's seat. It's a single seat cockpit, but that driver's seat is very wide. It's made for one action figure, though. The vehicle isn't quite wide enough to fit two figures in there. Um, it does have a couple control sticks, one on each side. To demonstrate putting a figure in the Paralyzer, let's use the Desert Scorpion, like on the box art. Uh, you just bend his legs and put him in the driver's seat. Uh, those control sticks are so far apart that his hands don't really reach them very well. Um, but uh, he does sort of fit in there, and he will stay in with the canopy closed. But, of course, if his arms are stretched out to reach the control sticks, you know, the canopy doesn't close very well. So he kind of has to have his hands by his side in order to close the canopy. The canopy, it's still an open cockpit, so he's still not protected by any armor. He is still exposed to enemy fire. You could put the figure in that way, but honestly, it's just as easy to place the figure in by putting him in through the top. The Paralyzer has four treads, two on each side. These are fake treads. They are in black plastic. The vehicle actually rolls on four wheels that are connected to the treads, one on each tread. These wheels and wheel connectors use the same mold as the ones on the mobile battle bunker, but in a different color. These treads are hinged at the back. That's what these orange connectors are for. So you can tilt the tread downward by pushing down at the front. Each one tilts downward like that, and that can place the paralyzer in an elevated position. 
This, I guess, you could use to fire from behind cover. The Paralyzer has a turret. It's a pretty large turret. It's located behind the cockpit. The turret will rotate 360 degrees, but you have to kind of work with it a little bit. As you can see, the gun kind of hits the head of the driver, but if you move it around a bit, you can rotate that turret 360 degrees. The turret has a gun and a missile launcher, and they will elevate about 45 degrees. And one thing I like is the gun and the missile launcher will elevate in sync. The gun is on the starboard side of the vehicle when facing forward. It is in a dark blue-green plastic. The blueprints call this a double-barreled concussion cannon with servo firepower. To me, that just sounds like random words. There's a tab at the top of the gun that you can pull back and pretend the gun is recoiling as it fires, and it will spring back forward, which is a pretty cool feature. There's a plastic wire that runs from the back of the gun down under the gun, and that provides the recoil feature. Uh, it's fine, it looks pretty cool, and it works pretty well. Uh, but unfortunately, it does tend to stress at this connector at the back, and that could be a point of breakage. On the other side of the turret is the spring-loaded missile launcher. The launcher itself is in orange plastic, and it has three dark blue-green missiles. These missiles can tab onto the launcher itself. It has the traditional G.I. Joe dumbbell-shaped uh, pegs and the missiles can peg on. And this is nice if they're going to give us extra missiles for these spring-loaded missile launchers. It's nice that they give us a way to store the extra missiles so they don't get lost. There are three missiles and three tabs for those missiles. To operate the missile launcher, just take one of the three missiles and press it into the hole in the front of the launcher. Press back until it clicks. The trigger is on the back of the launcher. You just press it to the right to fire. Let's demonstrate the missile launcher by firing at our favorite target, Dr. Mindbender. I don't really have anything especially against this Dr. Mindbender figure, but this became a tradition on this channel just because this figure happened to be handy when I was testing one of the missile launchers and I just kept using this guy. This is kind of close range, so I'm going to aim carefully and press the trigger over to fire. Ooh, yeah, a really powerful missile launcher. The blueprints call these missiles anti-radar electronically charged communication deactivation missiles. What? The missiles are the same color as the gun. They just use that same color plastic for the missiles and the gun and the wheels and the connector bar between the missile launcher and the gun. Basically, all the parts that weren't orange and black were molded in this color. Finally, we get to the rear of the vehicle, and the paralyzer does not have a universal tow hitch. That is unfortunate. That means it cannot tow any of Cobra's towed weapons, like the ASP and the asp. It does have a platform on the back with two foot pegs so it can carry two additional action figures. Let's demonstrate with the Crimson Guard Immortal, the same figure that is on the box art. Just peg his foot onto that foot peg and he should stay on there reasonably securely. Uh, this is great. I like this feature. I like having a platform that can carry extra troops. That is good. One downside, though, is it severely limits the range of motion for that turret. The gun runs into the guy on the back. But you can also pretend that this back gun is being manned by your Crimson Guard Immortal. Looking at how the Paralyzer was used in G.I. Joe Media, the Paralyzer was a mainstay of the Deke era of the animated series. It first appeared in the episode Channel. One thing I like about the Deke series is the toy accurate vehicle models. Deke may not have done everything well, but they did a good job animating the vehicles. Looking at the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, the Paralyzer was used quite a bit there too. They were often deployed as fast attack vehicles and usually worked in teams. At one point, Cobra Commander even drove one. As noted by many fans of 90s G.I. Joe, G.I. Joe's most successful years were in the early 90s. Sales were apparently bolstered by the addition of spring-firing weapons and cool live-action TV commercials. Through the leadership of Hasbro executive Kirk Bozigian, G.I. Joe sales were boosted from a low of $65 million in 1990 to a high of $100 million in 1992. The story for G.I. 
G.I. Joe in the early 90s was not all rosy. According to the book Toy Wars by G. Wayne Miller, market research in 1993 revealed G.I. Joe was losing popularity with kids. Boys were more interested in X-Men. The TV show's ratings were failing, and there were no plans on producing more shows. Further, quoting Miller, outlicensing income, an indicator of a property's resonance in the culture, was in its fourth straight year of decline. Those four years of decline included the otherwise profitable years of 1991 and 1992. G.I. Joe was in trouble by 1993. It was under these circumstances that Street Fighter was introduced to G.I. Joe. It's here that I turn the review over to the Dragon Fortress to talk about the history of Street Fighter and to review the Street Fighter version of the Paralyzer, the Sonic Boom Tank. I was born in 1984. The G.I. Joe of my childhood is the G.I. Joe that's so often scorned by people older than myself. My main childhood G.I. Joe years were 1990 through 1994. To you, that may be the era of bad, bright colors and lazy accessories, but to me, that was just G.I. Joe. In 1993, this is probably what my main G.I. Joe squad looked like. Thankfully, I can't see you doing a guile frown through the screen. Obviously, though, this is proof that I'm the best man for the job. Because I grew up in that era, HCC asked me for my perspective on the G.I. Joe Street Fighter toy line. I lived it. I was the perfect age and demographic for those toys when they came out. I loved both G.I. Joe and Street Fighter in 1993 and had several of the toys at the time. Today, we'll look at G.I. Joe's Street Fighter subline through the lens of the 1993 Sonic Boom Tank, a repaint of 1991's Cobra Paralyzer. In 1993, I received the Sonic Boom Tank as a reward for attending a chicken pox play date and the week or more of suffering that it caused me. Today, we'll see if this tank was worth the torture, and we'll also take a more nuanced, in-depth look at the intersection of the world warriors and a real American hero. Round 1, fight! In 1991, arcade-goers were introduced to the charming pixelated violence of Capcom's Street Fighter II. This revolutionary game allowed players to use weaponized yoga against both cars and sumo wrestlers. Because of these visionary gameplay features, Street Fighter II became the best-selling title since the golden age of arcade games. In the early 1990s, you'd find Street Fighter II everywhere. It was in my local arcade, at the drugstore by the comic book rack, and in the lobby of my neighborhood Pizza Hut. In an age before esports and Twitch streamers, people were intense about competing at Street Fighter 2. Even some of my friends wanted to get in on the action and would get soundly thrashed by squeaky voiced, wispy mustached teenagers at the local mall. By 1993, two years after Street Fighter 2's launch, sales were over $1.5 billion in gross revenue. More importantly, Street Fighter 2 came out for home consoles in 1992. When 1993 rolled around, a kid might have Street Fighter II Championship Edition, which allowed you to play as M. Bison, Vega, Balrog, and Sagat for their home console and a handful of Street Fighter II action figures to accompany the game cartridge. But what else was in the home of many kids in 1993? America's highly trained special mission force, G.I. Joe, of course. By 1993, the G.I. Joe toy line was already divided into several subseries many of which were answers to other pop culture trends. Hasbro released a Street Fighter II sub-team for the G.I. Joe line, where it joined the ranks of Ninja Force, Star Brigade, and others. But was Street Fighter II really a good fit for G.I. Joe? Let's figure it out together, using the Sonic Boom Tank and its driver, Championship Edition Grumpy Pants Guile, as an entry point. As early as 1988, G.I. Joe released figures in different sub-teams, such as Night Force, Python Patrol, Tiger Force, and Sonic Fighters, Many of those toys were just repaints of pre-existing figures. By 1991, though, the sub-teams included new figures and new characters. These new sub-teams, for better or for worse, existed to cash in on trends in pop culture and action figures. Want to save the environment? You can turn to Captain Planet, Widget the World Watcher, Zen, Intergalactic Ninja, or G.I. Joe's Eco Warriors. Interested in brightly colored martial arts mayhem? You've got the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and G.I. Joe's Ninja Force. War on Drugs? You've got your school's D.A.R.E. program, the video game NARC, and G.I. Joe's Drug Elimination Force. Want to take on some monstrous abominations? 
You have Kenner's Aliens toy line or G.I. Joe's Mega Marines. You see the pattern. Some G.I. Joe fans say this diversification was a soulless cash grab that destroyed the G.I. Joe brand in the 1990s. Other fans note that trying to stay current with different themes actually helped the G.I. Joe toy line last as long as it did. As a kid, I loved eco-warriors and appreciated the message. I also loved Ninja Force, Star Brigade, DEF, and the Mega Marines. I grew up on rented VHS tapes of the old cartoon and G.I. Joe the movie. To me, G.I. Joe was always a diverse science fiction property. These sub-teams might have been capitalizing on pop culture trends, but to a kid in the early 90s, they fit G.I. Joe perfectly. Hasbro's Street Fighter line was definitely capitalizing on a trend, but did it actually fit G.I. Joe perfectly? Round 2 Fight! Street Fighter 2 was huge in 1993. Without a doubt, it was a bigger cultural force than G.I. Joe. Capcom allowing Hasbro to integrate the cash cow that was Street Fighter 2 into the G.I. Joe line was an immense gift. It was like Capcom's international pop star giving Hasbro's less popular but well-respected garage band an opening slot on an international stadium tour. In short, the Street Fighter and G.I. Joe alliance was a great example of corporate brand synergy. I first heard about the Street Fighter toy line in my fourth or fifth grade classroom. At first, I didn't believe something so perfect could exist. Could I really have Ken, Ryu, and Chun-Li fight alongside Duke and Roadblock? When I went over to a friend's house and saw his Crimson Cruiser with M. Bison, I knew it was for real. For a time in 1993, the Street Fighter action figures were the most coveted toys at my school. If you had a Vega or a Blanca, you were a rock star. The 1993 Street Fighter subline consisted of 12 individually carded figures, three vehicles with drivers, and one playset with included figure. Many of the Street Fighter toys used existing bodies with new heads. Ninja Force molds and their spring-loaded martial arts action features were a popular and obvious choice for Street Fighter figures. Hasbro also got back together with some exes, which included a very scandalous and public display of affection for the Road Pig and Big Boa molds. They also gave Zangief robot legs and M. Bison a baseball jersey. So, that's a lot of repaints with new heads, but how lazy was the Street Fighter line, really? There were three all-new, all-original molds for the Street Fighter line. Dalzim, Sagat, and E. Honda all contained questionable action features, but were very detailed, well-done molds that closely reflected the video game characters. And we also need to talk about Chun-Li. Prior to 1993, the last female character Hasbro released in the G.I. Joe toy line was Jinx in 1987. Miraculously, two female characters showed up in 1993, Chun-Li and Scarlet, who both used the same body mold. Except for Bonsai's use for Vega, Chun-Li was the only figure in the Street Fighter line who used a 1993 mold. Most of these figures used much older molds, so Chun-Li and Scarlet were probably both planned uses for the mold. I don't think we would have gotten Ninja Force Scarlet without Chun-Li to make sure they got their money's worth. The various Ninja Force, Muscle Guy, and Robot parts used for the Street Fighter II line were often a poor match for their pixelated character models. They also came with weapons trees ill-suited to the characters. In fact, Vega, the only Street Fighter II character to use a weapon in the game, didn't come with his trademark claw, but Chun-Li did. Even as kids, we noticed these things. I believe 1993's Sonic Boom Tank and its driver Guile are the epitome of the Street Fighter II toy line. Let's take a look. The Sonic Boom Tank is a dark green and bright yellow recolor of the 1991 Cobra Paralyzer and retains all the features of that earlier toy. It includes a driver, Guile, repainted in a very sensible brown color scheme. Here's your military realism. Even though he uses parts from Road Pig, Dusty Version 3, and Roadblock Version 2, he is a pretty good representation of the game character. He's much more accurate to the source material than most of the figures in the Street Fighter line. But there is one problem, and it's the Guile frown. Guile is supposed to be the heroic U.S. military member that appeals to U.S. Street Fighter fans, but instead of his natural good looks and unnatural hairstyle, we got the world's grumpiest frown. This was not uncommon in the Street Fighter line. Ken, for instance, looks more like a clean-shaven Chuck Norris than an American playboy martial artist who listens to Alice in Chains while he drives his convertible around Malibu. And Guile is frowning the entire time. But, I gotta say, Guile makes sense with G.I. Joe. In the games, he's portrayed as a major in the United States Air Force. 
His military background makes him a natural fit. I'd say he fits him better with Joe than any other Street Fighter character. Though M. Bison, a terrorist leader, and Chun-Li, an Interpol investigator, also make sense. The Sonic Boom Tank itself is a pretty decent small vehicle. It fit the G.I. Joe aesthetic I was used to at the time, and the military green is a nice color. I used it with my regular G.I. Joe figures more than my Street Fighter figures, and it got a fair amount of use from me as a kid. I still really enjoy the cockpit detailing and the pom-pom guns. But how much sense does this vehicle make? Well, for starters, Guile is in the Air Force. It would make much more sense for him to come with a jet like a repaint of the Storm Eagle. That would even somewhat match the background of his video game stage. But a tank is a bit more playable than a jet, especially because this tank can fit a couple more of his World Warrior friends on its foot pegs. To me, the Sonic Boom Tank sort of resembles the Wolverine. It has the same open cockpit design and a rear-mounted missile rack. Not to mention the colors are similar. In fact, I display and photograph the Sonic Boom Tank with CoverGirl in the driver's seat. She just really seems to fit. By now, you're beginning to see how the Street Fighter toys do, or do not, fit with G.I. Joe. But what about Street Fighter as a concept? Round 3, fight! Both brands have some themes in common. They're both about a band of plucky, individualistic heroes who work together as a team to take down a shadowy terrorist organization. There also could be an underground high-stakes fighting tournament in the world of G.I. Joe. M. Bison's Shadow Lou would be a good ally or competitor for Cobra or the Headhunters, though Destro might get jealous. Guile and Chun-Li could easily fit on the core G.I. Joe team, and the martial arts theme is a logical step forward from Ninja Force. But, Mega Monsters aside, G.I. Joe doesn't have many characters like Blanca. G.I. Joe team members can't harness their body's natural energy to throw Hadoukens or Sonic Booms. Yoga Flames are also out of the question. So it seems like the fit is middling at best, more of a marriage of convenience than a marriage of passion. However, there is something that might convince you. A conversation with my friend Dan several years ago made me realize that the 1994 Jean-Claude Van Damme Street Fighter movie is, in fact, the best live-action G.I. Joe movie of all time. The next time you watch it, watch it through that lens and your appreciation for it might increase. When the JCVD movie came out, Hasbro's Street Fighter toy line continued alongside it, minus the G.I. Joe branding. In 1994, Hasbro was obviously hedging its bets more on Street Fighter than G.I. Joe. That same year, they also rolled out a Mortal Kombat toy line. The 1994 Street Fighter movie toys greatly improved on the previous year's line, with better sculpts and cooler vehicles, including versions of the Dragonfly and Snowcat. Ultimately, though, Hasbro dropped the G.I. Joe branding because it didn't see Street Fighter fitting with G.I. Joe, and that's because Street Fighter, at the time, had its own much stronger legs. In the 90s, Street Fighter outlived G.I. Joe with movies, a Saturday morning cartoon, comics, an anime film, and many more games. In 1998, Toy Biz would release a much more appropriate toy line in X-Men vs. Street Fighter and continue on to Marvel vs. Capcom. It somehow made much more sense to see Ryu fighting Wolverine than it did to see Ryu fighting Duke. Street Fighter can fit in with G.I. Joe if you're open-minded, but it is a bit of a stretch. Even I admit that. Even if you're not open-minded, though, some of the Street Fighter figures and vehicles from 93 and 94 fit in pretty nicely with the toys from G.I. Joe's later years. Remember, it's your imagination, and you can use these toys however you want to. I personally think many of these toys deserve a second look, even the Sonic Boom Tank. Regardless of how either of us feel, Street Fighter was officially part of G.I. Joe for a year, and it was a Hasbro product with G.I. Joe construction, even beyond that. Street Fighter toys were loved by kids my age at the time. I was there and I lived it. I remember it well. These toys were exciting for Street Fighter kids who didn't even like G.I. Joe, and it gave G.I. Joe kids more characters and vehicles to choose from. Objectively, it was a pretty lazy cash-in that produced varied results. But Street Fighter is a weird, charming, wild, and worthwhile part of G.I. Joe's history. Thank you to the Dragon Fortress for covering that material so well. I don't have the background to cover it as well as that. Even though we disagree about the merits of Street Fighter toys, the perspective of the Dragon Fortress is important to know and understand. Looking at the Paralyzer overall, obviously I'm not going to like the color. Cobra gets more leeway than G.I. Joe when it comes to obnoxious colors, but the orange on this one is still over the top. 
I can kind of tolerate it as a desert color, but there are still better colors to use for a desert vehicle. Looking beyond the color, the toy itself has some decent features for a vehicle its size. It has a fair number of moving parts. It has the recoil on the gun, it has the elevating tracks, it has the opening canopy. A lesser toy line would have done without most of those features. I still have a hard time calling it a tank though. It is a tracked vehicle, but it doesn't have any armor to protect the driver. As usual, the driver is a exposed to enemy fire. The Street Fighter version of this toy has a better color scheme. If Street Fighter took this mediocre G.I. Joe toy and made it better, why wouldn't I want to add that to my collection? Well, I guess I gotta talk about that now. You've heard the Dragon Fortress talk about his perspective and why he considers Street Fighter 2 to be part of G.I. Joe. My perspective is a bit different. Other than having the G.I. Joe label and being in a couple of the TV commercials, I don't see these as having anything to do with G.I. Joe. I think Street Fighter was brought under the umbrella of G.I. Joe for one reason, to inflate the sales of G.I. Joe during a time when the numbers were sagging. The earliest waves of Street Fighter 2 figures recycled the bodies of G.I. Joe figures, and often they had little resemblance to the characters in the game. Is there anything bad about Street Fighter? Of course not. Is there anything wrong? with the toys? Not if you like them, not at all. But I feel like this effort to shoehorn Street Fighter 2 into G.I. Joe shortchanged Street Fighter fans. A lot of the figures had springy action gimmicks often copied from G.I. Joe's Ninja Force figures. I think that actually makes some sense for Street Fighter 2. But what makes less sense is making the Street Fighter 2 figures in G.I. Joe's scale. G.I. Joe's 3 and 3 quarter inch scale is perfect for a toy line with a lot of vehicles, which I think was less necessary for Street Fighter 2. I think Street Fighter 2 figures would make more sense in a larger scale, maybe He-Man scale, which I think would be more fun in one-on-one -on -one battles, like in the game. They should still have their springy action features to mimic the moves the characters made in the game, and most importantly, have the figures resemble the characters in the game. Instead of getting toys that would make more sense for Street Fighter 2 and would closer mimic the play pattern of the game, instead you got recycled G.I. Joe toys. And aside from the TV commercials, no real effort to integrate them. You don't have a reason to play with your Street Fighter 2 toys and your G.I. Joe toys together. That's my perspective on Street Fighter 2. The game is not bad, obviously, and there's nothing wrong with the toys, and there's nothing wrong with the people who collect and enjoy those toys. I just don't consider them to be part of G.I. Joe. And if you're a Street Fighter fan, I kind of think you deserve better. That was my review of the Paralyzer and the Dragon Fortress's review of the Sonic Boom Tank. Thank you to the Dragon Fortress for being part of this video. Make sure you check out his website, especially if you like 90s G.I. Joe, you want to follow what this guy is doing. I think it's important in a fandom to have a variety of opinions and perspectives, as long as the people who hold those opinions and perspectives can behave respectfully toward each other. And thank you to the Dragon Fortress for doing that here. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, I'm making more like it. So please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the notification bell so you don't miss any future videos, and share this video with your friends. That's what helps this channel grow. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. If you want to know if I've already reviewed a vintage G.I. Joe item, that's a good place to check. Special thanks to all my supporters on Patreon, including the names you see on the screen now. Support on Patreon helps keep this show going, so if you like the show and you'd like to support the show in that way, please consider checking out Patreon. You can get some special rewards, including early access to reviews, and you can find out how to decode the secret messages you see in these videos. Thank you for joining me on this adventure of collecting vintage G.I. Joe toys. I'll see you next time, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe.
kind of like Street Fighter 2 G.I. Joe toys. 2-1. And I don't. We must fight! That's it for punches and kicks.